You're listening to Make Him Famous, a sermon series at Bay City Church, walking through the core values of the church as we seek to make the name of Jesus famous in our city. For this and more audio content, visit baycity.church. Today we are in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 30. So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn there with me. We are studying the woman at the well, a text many of you may have possibly been in before, but I hope I can bring some new light to it. You see, the reason why is uh, for Bay City Church, one of our core values is, uh, actually the very first core value is encountering Jesus. And so this is the best text to see people encounter Jesus. So we're going to dive in and, and pick this verse apart, these verses apart. So if you'll join me in prayer, we'll get started. Father, I, I'm, I, I'm amazed at the fact that I have the opportunity again to open your word before your people. This is a, not something I take lightly. I'm just so excited and I'm thrilled by it. As we go through this text that many of us can encounter Jesus, some of us for the first time, but certainly over and over again, because the more we engage you, Lord God, the better we turn out, because more of you is always a better, good thing. Thank you for your son, whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> So why is encountering Jesus one of the core values at my church? Why is, it the, why is it the core value of every church? That's really, it should be the core value of every church. The reason is because everything in the Christian faith really begins with an encounter. Everything has to begin with this first encounter, this coming upon the good news and the person of Jesus. It all begins here. But, you know, I live in San Francisco. I'm from the Bay Area. And as you know, you guys all mostly probably live in the Silicon Valley area. You know that most of us are fashioning our lives around something much different than an encounter with Christ. And I'll be honest with you. I've done this. I became a Christian at 18. It's exhausting trying to figure out, fashion your life, give yourself dignity, value, purpose, and worth with your actions, with your job, whatever it may be. It's tiring. And especially in like the culture of Silicon Valley, the hustle, the grind. There's so many of these things. Many of us, man, we jump from thing to thing to thing, trying to give, give ourselves some sort of goal out there that we can reach, that we can kind of dedicate our lives to. And if it's a big enough goal, that'll a- occupy enough time. So we set these goals out ahead of us. We're always fired up. But then there are those of us that we kind of start a project or something, and we fizzle out, right? We fizzle out, but we jump from another project to, to another project and another project and another project. Always being fired up, but never making progress. This is, this is the quintessential life of the Silicon Valley, the, the San Francisco Bay Area person. This is what we do. Some of us, though, we are making progress, right? Some of us feel like we're jumping from thing to thing, and maybe we found our niche. Maybe we started that company, whatever it is, found the spouse. Things are going well. Things are good. I like it. I, good, thing, good things. It's good to have a spouse. It's good to start companies. These are all positive things. But maybe we found that thing that's grounded us, that's given us the foundation for our lives. But where does the authority lie in that? I'm just going to ask that question. That's the biggest thing I think I'm working through in my life. By what authority is your purpose in your life that you fashion for yourself, what authority is it based on? Now, um, I've come to find planting a church the last 18 months that people in, in San Francisco have an opinion about stuff. It's a new thing I've discovered. I didn't know that before, okay? Everyone has the answers to everything. And what's really interesting is that everybody thinks that they're, including myself, because I'm from the Bay Area, we all think that we're unscathed from bias, from socialization, culturalization, and the media. We've discovered our own purpose apart from everything else, okay? I'm here to tell you that's probably not true. The foundation for the way you've decided to live your life is probably rooted in family, your city, the Western world, your culture, your job, the way you were raised. You see, it's interesting to find that most 35-year-old people think they've found the best way to live in their own mind, okay? I'm here to tell you, actually, it's probably not true. You see, we're all a prisoner of time and circumstance. We've all been affected by the things around us individually. And that's the way we've shaped our ideologies. And if you have found that thing that's going to govern your life outside of the encounter from Jesus, it will eventually run out. It always does until you find something new. So encountering Jesus, though, gives us the bedrock framework for how we are going to live our life. Okay, that's my thesis for you, okay? So many of us are longing to find out what our mission will be for our lives. 
But in order to know what we need to do, we need to first understand who we need to be. Otherwise, we root ourselves in what we do instead of who we are. And I'll tell you today that Jesus Christ is the one who tells us who we are, okay? So encountering Jesus gives us this inner ballast, this inner ballast that keeps us afloat. When the world comes, when we fail at that beautiful, wonderful job, or if our marriage isn't doing as well as we thought it would be, Jesus provides the inner palace, a steady joy, a calm, and an inner peace. And as we encounter Jesus, I hope for all of us this morning, we get to see a woman encounter Christ for the very first time, and we get to take her example as the way we're going to understand our progression for how we engage Jesus. It's weird. Jesus gives us a six-step progression for how to engage him, okay? Six steps. So if you follow these steps, you'll have joy, peace, wealth. No, I'm just kidding. You'll engage Jesus in a way that will radically change your life and provide an inner balance that will transform you from the inside out. Check this out. What do we do first? Jesus says, actually, number step one, Jesus initiates. So the very first thing to realize about you pursuing or encountering Jesus is that first he encounters you. So we don't get to go out and search for him and look for, he actually finds us. And so if you're like, I, well, you're telling me right now to go find him. This is Jesus encountering you as we speak. He sought you out. Look at verse five in our text. So he, that's Jesus, came to a town of Samaria called Sakar near a field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. So it was, about the, it was as it was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaria. So the sixth hour is about noon-ish, okay? It's about noon in the Middle East. Middle East is pretty hot, okay? Yeah, in San Francisco, it's like 58 and foggy today. And as I drove down here, it felt like the Middle East, <laughs> mainly because I drive an old truck with the ACs not working that well. But it felt hot, okay? Very hot. And in the Middle East, it's very hot. And so typically when you go to a well, many of you may know, you probably wouldn't go in the middle, stark middle of the day where it's the most hot. You'd probably wait till a cooler hour, the early morning, the late evening, probably a better time to go to a well. But this woman was at this well in the middle of the day, and there's no one else around here. There's Jesus, and there's this woman. Now, subsequent archaeological, st archaeological studies have actually believed that there are actually two other wells in between this well and the woman's place of origin. So not only did she skip the well in her town, she may have possibly skipped two other wells to come to this well. So she walked an exorbitant distance to get out of wherever she was. Why do you think that was? Well, she probably wanted to be avoided, right? It's possible, as we see later in her story, that she had actually maybe been a social outcast. She'd been a social outcast, so she didn't want to show her face for a very specific reason. We'll find out that she's actually been divorced many times, and in that culture, that's social suicide, right? That's incredibly, incredibly bad to do. Like, you think, you know, Kevin Durant having some Twitter burner accounts is a bad thing, right? That's not a good look. This is really a not a good look. Five husbands, as we'll see, all divorced. Bad situation. Now, when does Jesus approach this woman in this text? I believe, looking at the Bible, that she appro he approaches this woman, rather, when she does not want to be approached. He approaches her when she doesn't want to be talked to, by a man, by a Jew, and he approaches her when she is living out the ramifications of her deep brokenness. What do I mean by that? Well, she skipped two wells to find this well. She's in the middle of the day. She's living out the ramifications of what it means to live a life broken in this social time. And so because she wants to avoid people, because she doesn't want to be ostracized, because she doesn't want to be publicly scrutinized, she's come out in the middle of the day. And so she's living out the ramifications of her deep brokenness. Let me look at verse 9 here. The Samaritan woman says to him, How is it that you, a Jew, talking to Jesus, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. In other words, she's saying this. What do you want with me, Jesus? What do you want with me? 
Look, look at the, look, there's a long list of reasons you don't want to talk to me. What do you want? Number one, she's a woman, right? We don't talk to women in this day. Jews don't talk to women. Samaritan men don't deal with women in public, let alone Jewish men. Then she's a Samaritan. There's a social class. Jews don't deal with Samaritans in public. Why are you doing this? And listen, I, I get, the, I get the, like, the, I, the ability right here for all of us to kind of check out and go, this is just this really old, weird Samaritan Canaan, I don't know all those weird words. I'm not really paying attention to what's being said here, but we do this all the time ourselves. Jesus comes upon us and encounters us in such a way, and we look back at Jesus and we say, what do you want with me, Jesus? What do you want with me? I've sinned so much in my life. I've gone too far. What do you want with me? Friend of mine, account executive, big company, Silicon Valley, went to college, partied, had a really rough time in college. Jesus engages him constantly and he calls me and says, Eddie, I, I want to talk about Jesus. You've been hammering me and I'll be honest with you, I've really hated all the times you have brought up Jesus to me. But for whatever reason, I'm thinking about it right now. And um, I just have one question for you. How is God going to forgive all of the terrible things that I've done? And listen, we hear that all of the time. But when you're walking in that, it's very hard to feel forgivable in those moments. And we feel the exact same way. Now, in a, soul, in a, in a place like Silicon Valley, there's another way we might say, what do you want with me, Jesus? And there's another way we might actually say that. We might say this to God. Hey, God, my life is fine. What do you want with me? You see, we're kind of acknowledging the fact that he's encountered us, and we come and say, listen, my bank account's good, my job is good, my marriage is good, my dating relationship is good, whatever it might be, it's good. What do you want with me, Jesus? We see here that Jesus is actually really totally fine with breaking down social, cultural, and relational barriers to talk to people in order to initiate with us. He's totally fine with that. Some of us think we're just too far bad to overcome. God breaks down those barriers. And when we put up our own barriers to keep God out, he has no problem breaking down those either. So our first thing, Jesus initiates, God begins the encounter. Here's our second thing, our second point, our progression. So Jesus initiates, number one. Second one, he, Jesus, offers a gift. He comes with a gift, okay? He, he's not just going to hammer you in and then just say, follow me. He actually brings a, a gift. Look at verse 10. Jesus answered her, so if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So after the Samaritan woman, she asked this question and Jesus answers her. He gives her a really interesting, giving a really magnificent answer. If you ask me as I'm reading through this, even now. He offers her a gift, but let me break down exactly what this gift is, because when I read this, especially in the ESV or some of these other translations, it gets a little murky. So let me break this down exactly for you, okay? First, Jesus says this, if you only knew, or if she only knew, if she only knew these two realities, the gift of God and who it is that's talking to you, then this reality, these two realities would be true. You would have asked him for the gift and he would have given it to you. That's the living water. So let's break this down. The first thing, if you only knew the gift of God, what's this gift? This is the gift of living water, the power of God for salvation, the Holy Spirit that would come upon someone and transform them from the inside out, the point of the encounter. That's the gift of God. The gift is not a result of anything she's done. It's certainly not a, a, a result of admitting you want the gift. It's a gift that Jesus brings, okay? So we see the gift of God. And then what else? And who it is that's talking to you. And who's talking to her here? Jesus. Jesus. Not a guy named Jesus, okay? Not a guy that, you know, is working at the gas station or sits next to you in your cubicle, just happens to be named Jesus. This is the Messiah King of the universe, the coming Lord. If you only knew that I had the gift of the Holy Spirit for you and that the literal Messiah was the one delivering the gift, then you would have asked me before I even said anything. Why? Because you would understand that this is the Messiah and he's got a lot of power, okay? Not, not just the words he speaks, but his presence, essence, and being 
This is the omnipotent king who was there in the beginning with the God, the father to, to form the world. His very hands hold the water onto the globe from spilling into the, into the space. That's pretty powerful. He also has the ability to free her from whatever transgression she's in. Then you would have asked, and what would Jesus have done? It says here, he would have given you the living water. What does this mean? This means for all of us that all you have to do is ask. That's it. All you have to do is ask. It's ask and it will be done unto you. You want the spirit of God in your life. You want the power of God for salvation in your life. All you have to do is ask. Do you have to put on a tie that's worthy for the Lord before he's going to give you the gift of the spirit? No. Do you have to shine up your life before you come to God? My same friend I'm talking to, Silicon Valley account executive, makes lots of money. He says to me as after, as in this middle of this conversation, okay, I see what you're saying. God can forgive me, but I got to do a few things first. Okay, the first thing I need to do is I got to stop drinking. Probably a good idea. Then I need to probably start going to church a few times to kind of prove that I'm, you know, making progress, Okay. And then once I go to church a little bit, maybe get my wife in there once, right? Then I can come to God and say, okay, God, I've done a few things. I've got a resume. Uh -uh. Wrong. Jesus gives living water regardless of where, what your standing is. This is the, the scandal of this whole, this whole like prosperity, works-based, righteous, demonic deal that's taking place. Here's the scandal of the gospel, okay? Let me break it down for you. This is our... This is our ideal image. All of us have one. We're all trying to form this ideal image of this person that we're longing for. They're, this person's usually richer, better looking, got better abs, spouse is good, kids are obedient, Instagram's got more followers, more likes, comments, views, more clout, bigger 401k, gonna get an IPO, the whole deal, okay? This is the image. And then this is the shadow of us. This is this broken, fallen, sinful, disobedient human being that we all feel like we're trying to avoid. Now, some of us live closer to the ideal, and maybe some of us think we're our ideal, and some of us live closer to the shadow, and some of us might feel like we are our shadow, but somewhere along the spectrum, you fall, okay? The scandal of the gospel is that no matter where you're at along that spectrum, if you encounter Jesus, you get to get into the kingdom of God the same. God does not love you more being closer to your ideal self than if he found you here. In other words, if this woman at the well, this Samaritan woman only had two broken marriages instead of five, that God loves her that much more. That's why the gospel is so unbelievable to people. That's why religious people say, no, 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 there's got to be more to it because it's not about you. It's about him and the work he's done. And wherever you fall on the spectrum, whether you're in your shadow or whether you're in your ideal, your real self is fully forgiven in Jesus Christ as you encounter him. That's what the scandal of the gospel is. It's beautiful. So we see this, that Jesus offers this beautiful gift wherever we're at on the spectrum. Point three. So he initiates, he offers a gift, and then he challenges your worldview. So Jesus brings some, he brings some ground rules, okay? He, he brings some, some ideas. He, he wants you to break off from some of the stuff you're doing. Let's see what he does to the Samaritan woman. Verse 11, the woman said to him, sir, have you nothing to draw water with? And the well is deep. She's talking about, she's talking about this well here. Where do you get that living water you're talking about? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well. He drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come back to draw water. The next thing Jesus does is he flips your worldview on its head. So he initiates an encounter with you. He initiates the encounter. He offers a gift, and then he takes your worldview and flips it. I remember when I was in college, I was sitting in my, uh, my apartment, and I became a Christian at 18. And I'm um, sitting there, and I remember thinking so much about the world. But when I read, I, was, I, I got saved reading the Bible. I read through the Bible, and I met Jesus reading. It was really, really cool now that I look back on it. 
And as I'm reading it, I remember my world kind of flipping. Have you ever seen those movie scenes where like the, the, the whole scene flips over and it's kind of like meant to symbolize a change in the plot, right? That was what happened in my world, right? I was like, holy cow, and, whoosh, and it flips. Your worldview gets changed. The things you thought were good are no longer good. The things you thought were bad are no longer bad. Things that you thought mattered don't matter anymore, and things that didn't matter in your life matter. That's the change in your worldview, and he's doing it to her right here. Why? Why, why, can, why do we see that here? This woman here, she still doesn't actually even get what Jesus is saying. She's still in her old worldview. In fact, she appeals to Jacob. Jacob, you know, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, right? Jacob builds this well, and she's referring back to Jacob because she sees Jacob with like bars or clout. And she said, well, this is Jacob's well. And Jacob's, all his sons drank from this well. And G Jesus is thinking, okay, I wrestled with Jacob around that time, okay? That was maybe a few hundred thousand years after I created the world. Okay, where does that fall in my timeline? You know, Jesus exists outside of time, right? God is omnipotent, omnipresent. And so he's listening to her very patiently talk about Jacob. And then she even throws this down. Yo, his livestock even drank from this water. I mean, that's big time. And he's thinking, okay, very cool. And then Jesus decides, you know, instead of getting frustrated, like I think maybe I would have gotten frustrated with her. He then just kind of says this in verse 14. Whoever drinks of this water, well, you know, whoever drinks of my water is never going to be thirsty again. And then now the gears start turning in her head. She's starting to go, huh, okay. So this living water is a big deal. Where do I get this stuff? Is this like that expensive stuff you get in Las Vegas, like Voss, like, you know, $8 a thing? Like, do, where do I get that? Okay, how much money is it? And she's looking for this expensive stuff. And then I thought about this idea. She says this right at the end. Where's that water so I don't have to come here again to draw water? In other words, she's starting to see the glimpse of how God could work in her lives, but her worldview hasn't fully flipped. So she's just thinking about how I can take God and utilize him in the life I've already have so he can make the, the ramifications of the way I'm walking my life a little easier. She's not thinking about living water at all. She just doesn't want to have to come back to this well in the middle of the day. And yet we all do the very same thing. Here comes the Jesus juke, okay? Here it comes. You, we all utilize, manipulate, and take the goodness of God's word and read it and apply words to our lives without actually changing them. But Jesus says, actually, you've got to challenge your worldview. You've got to get the, the moment where you flip over in your head. And then he does this point. Here's our, her fourth point in our progression. He then ups the ante on this worldview. He points out exactly where we need to change points out her brokenness. Jesus said to her, verse 16, go and call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying you have no husband. I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. And then the woman said to him, sir, I believe you are a prophet. She, she responds very pointedly. Before he says anything else, Jesus points out her brokenness. Why? Because there is something in the way of her experiencing the true benefit of the living water. And he wants to make that clear. In this case for her, there's something else she loves more. There's something else, and that's these relationships with these men. And Jesus knew it. He didn't even ask her. He could have asked her and pretended, but he just told her, which proves his point even more. He told her where she would not be able to experience the power of Jesus in her life. Now, God says, right, you can't serve two masters, okay, you can't serve both God and money, you can't serve two things at once, you worship one th item, what will you worship, will it be God or will it be something else? We see that right here, and she's toying with this idea of, okay, Jesus has benefit here, but maybe I can just utilize him, and maybe I can continue the life I've got, but maybe it'll just make my life a little easier and I'll continue down my path. Jesus is trying to divert her path, not make her path easier. He's trying to give her a new path. That's what the encounter of Jesus does. He wants to give her a narrow path, a hard path, but a joyous, loving, good, perfect path that leads to him, not the path she's on. This is what's happening here. And men, for whatever reason, this seems to be her issue. But God is better for her than longing in these issues. He's longing, he's better than this. She's been kissed by lots of men. She needs to experience intimacy row with God. 
And that's exactly what he's saying. Men were, are, are committing to her, getting married to her. They'd be faithful to her. But no man is faithful like Jesus. A lot of men will make promises to this woman. But no promise is bigger and better and more faithful and in a covenantal way than God's promise. See, what she's seeking in men, she'll only find in Jesus. And what we seek in our jobs, our philanthropic endeavors, our bank accounts, we only find in Christ. You cannot use God to do your plan. God wants you to follow his plan, and it's better. It's very, it's, it's much better. What else does God do? He points out our brokenness, and then he moves on. Okay, now that I've broken you down, I'm going to build you back up a little bit, okay? Let me lay down the authentic groundwork for a relationship with me. This is what he does with her in verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here where the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. That's a good key thing, spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. He was called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all these things. <laughs> Man, she's not getting it. She is not getting it. And he says, okay. And he doesn't go, hey, look at me. He says, the one you're talking to, that's me. So he breaks it down. Tonight. He's so patient. He's so much more patient than me. He's so much more patient than all of us. And his patience is what leads to this woman's softness of heart. This is a beautiful moment. Here we get the main points of the passage. The Jews had actually been utilizing the temple as their main place of worship, okay? But Jesus is now saying that an hour is coming and is upon them that worship would not have to take place there, but it could take place anywhere. Why? Because it would not take place at a place, but a person. And that's Christ. Now we can worship and encounter Jesus anywhere because he is everywhere. This is the beauty of the whole gospel. And he's trying to break this down for her in this moment. So how do we counter Jesus exactly? What are these ground rules? He gives two. You worship in spirit and in truth. Both. 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 And I suspect, I suspect being an Acts 29 church, because I have one of those two, that we may lean a little more towards the truth than the spirit. I'm suspecting. I don't know for sure, but we'll touch on both. How are we accidentally looking, leaning in God towards truth and not enough towards the spirit? This is typical of a lot of religious folks, religious and non-religious, but when I say non-religious, I mean really religious people in non-religious ways, okay? I know a lot, I read a lot, I podcast a lot, therefore I must know God very well. We know lots about God, we study God, we read books, we go online, we have the UPS truck coming to our house all the time. Okay, well, you should see my uh, podcast feed. It's, it's pretty intense. I mean, have you guys listened to the new Malcolm Gladwell stuff? I mean, I've got some good stuff on there, okay? And that's the way we're kind of building up our intellectual identities, right? We're, we, we've got lots of truth, okay? And we, 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 we take pictures of our books and our moleskins and post them. All sorts of weird, bizarre ways we get uh, intellectual uh, notoriety in bars. I like to say bars, okay? You say, I know God. But actually, if you only worship, it says right here, if you only worship in truth and not spirit, you probably actually don't know God very well. You say, I do know God. Well, it's interesting. This word knowledge, I'm re studying this word knowledge, the Greek word epignosis, really roughly translates something interesting. It, rough, it roughly translates to this idea of an encounter, which is awesome. So true knowledge actually isn't learning about something. It's actually about encountering it. You get the full brunt and force and weight of exactly what the object of the knowledge is by encountering it fully. It's a full encounter. You can't just encounter it only in truth. You have to encounter it in the spirit of the encounter as well. Okay. So we see that Jesus initiates. We see that he offers a gift. He challenges our worldview. He points out our brokenness. He then lays the groundwork for authentic relationship. And our last thing he does, which is the best part, he empowers us to tell people about that encounter. Look at verse 27. Just then the disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar. That's the thing she came, by the way. She brought that to get water. She left the water and she went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. So what happens first? Like before she leaves back to the town to go tell people about him. What happens? What's the first thing we see? 
Were you guys sleeping on me? She leaves her jar. She left her bucket. The very vehicle she was utilizing to draw her regular water with, she leaves. Why? I think it's because, I think it's because she's on the scent. Her worldview is starting to flip. She's starting to feel it. Jesus is starting to transform her, change her, move her. She's no longer thinking about her earthly, worldly needs. She's starting to think about something greater. This living water might be seeping into her skin. It's happening. The desire for her old water has begun to leave her, and it's starting to be superseded with a desire for the living water. So all of us, and for fear of juking you too badly here, we all have things in our way that are keeping us from leaving our buckets and seeking out Christ, okay? What have you been using to continually go back to the well of insufficiency, guilt, lies, sin, defeat, greed, discontentment in your life? What are they? When I was writing this sermon, I was actually in a, co- I was in a coffee shop, not, unsurpri- not unsurprisingly. Uh, I was in a coffee shop, and uh, there was a girl who was about college age. I was by at San Francisco State, and she had her laptop open. And she was on Pinterest, not, also not unsurprisingly, and she, she was pinning um, different posts. And I don't always do this, but when you have those Big Macs, you know, and you know, the angle was perfect, I just looked up and I saw Pinterest. And I was right at the point, at this point in the message, and on her Pinterest board were some interesting things. She had a bunch of different quotes. Motivation, I want to make sure I get this right, there, there were motivation quotes about moving on from bad relationships. What, are, what is the irony of that? And she had different, you know, he's not that great, and don't worry, you'll be fine, and life is better on the other side, and all these different things. And I, I'm watching her, and as she pins them, she just gives a quick little nod, like, hmm, good. That's a good one. That's a good one. And she, at, in this moment, she's being motivated. She's being motivated. And she's in, engaging in a, this motivational practice where she's beginning to build herself up, clearly as someone who's been in a bad relationship. Motivation is a finite resource. Motivation gets you going. It gets you started. It's this good thing we should try to use to engage in certain things. But transformation sustains us throughout the entire process. You can get motivated to do something and just trail off into the abyss, but transformation is what engages you. And this Pinterest board has absolutely no power for transformation. And many of us have very, the very same things that we do to try to motivate ourselves to be better people towards our own path. But Christ is yanking us off that path and placing us on his path and motivating us and transforming us and regenerating us and sanctifying us all at the same time. You may notice something about these six steps toward your progression engaging with God. None of them have anything to do with you doing anything. He initiates. He lays the ground rules. He points the brokenness out. He motivates us to tell people about him. It's about him. Our job now is to respond. Jesus extends an invitation. I want to encounter you in a way that's going to transform you. And now we respond. Now how do we do this? We do this a number of ways. We do this from recognizing that Jesus is who he says he is. This might be the Messiah. Do you believe he might have been the one that, to motivate me? He told me all that I ever did. All of these different questions. And now we must come and see and encounter him in a way that might change us and leave our buckets. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for a radical encounter for all of us here this, this, uh, this afternoon, this early evening. I'm not, I'm, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility at all for every single one of us to encounter God in, an, in even a slightly better way even here right now. Lord God, as you encounter us and change us and move us and shape us, I pray for open hearts and open minds to what you're going to do. You see, Lord, you're about to work a six-step progression on all of us, and we, our job will be to respond to your call and to get off our path and to join you on yours. And your path is so much better. It's so much more peaceful. It's so much more joyous. It's, there's less pressure. There's no anxiety. The stress levels are down. I get to enjoy you and commune you with you in ways that are so amazing. A great, sturdy, mighty tree of life on a hot day that I can rest underneath beside a river of life that you might bring me life a river of life forever, that I don't have to go back into the world bringing these buckets and buckets and buckets, trying to fill out this water. Man, I sure hope there's water down there. 
Lord God, your well always has water in it. I'm praying for my friends today in Jesus' name. Amen.